Hi, this is Mike Baker. I want to talk about the resurrection of the dead again. We need to cover a few more things. We're going into another aspect of resurrections that we find in the Bible. We find in the Word. Father, we ask you to give us wisdom and understanding, knowledge. Open our minds up to see your Word. We just welcome the Holy Spirit to just teach us. Bring us into that union. Now, Lord, I know if you do it with me, you can do it with anybody. I'm not the sharpest tool in your shed. So I want to thank you and praise you. I don't say that I know anything, but I know some things. I don't know everything, but I know some things. So I ask in Jesus' name, believing that we receive. Thank you, Lord. Amen and amen. We're going to talk about resurrection. Resurrection from the dead. Now we talked about Jesus showing proof of his resurrection in our last study. Did he rise from the dead in the same body? Did he get the same body? Yes. Lots of witnesses. Lots of testimonies. Historical testimony. Historical witnesses. Uh, the history of salvation in the Bible. Now if anybody could tear that up for you, then they'll start on Jesus not being raised from the dead. And he's hid someplace in some cave somewhere. His dead bleached bones are, are still there. That's not true. That's not true. Uh, that's not true. Just experientially with the Holy Spirit and the Word of God and Him performing the blood of Jesus and the sacraments and the beautiful things in Christianity after I received the Lord, uh, I'm not, like I said before, if it can happen to me, it can happen to anybody. Uh, the Word of God. The resurrection from the dead. Let's start the book of well, let's start in Ephesians. This is a, a, a type of resurrection for for you Christians. What did God, what did Jesus do for you? What did he do for us? What did he do for us? Ephesians chapter 2. We we'll start with verse 4. But God being, I'm reading from the Amplified, so very rich in mercy because of his great and wonderful love with which he loved us, even when we were spiritually dead and separated from him because of our sins, he made us spiritually alive together with Christ. It's for by grace. And we said like he did everything. You have to. Man couldn't figure it out. You wouldn't know. You wouldn't know gold from dirt if God didn't show you and tell you. His undeserved favor and mercy. You've been saved from God's judgment. You have been saved from God's judgment. You have been saved from God's judgment. He raised you up. And he raised us up together with him. This is not some metaphorical or metaphysical mess. He did this in the courts of God. When we believed he did that and seated us with him in the heavenly places. Our position. Because we are in Christ Jesus because of that. And he did this so that in the ages to come he might clearly show the immeasurable and surpassing riches of his grace in his kindness towards us in Christ Jesus by providing for our redemption. For it's by grace, God's remarkable compassion and favor drawing you to Christ that you've been saved, actually delivered from judgment, giving you eternal life through faith. And this salvation is not your, of yourself. It's not through your own effort. But it is undeserved, gracious gift of God. Not a result of your works, nor your attempt to keep the law, till that no one can boast of your salvation. This is a resurrection. Spiritual transformation and a resurrection. This is uh, uh, undeserved. It's the resurrection. Our physical bodies are still subject to death, but there is there's something inside us. We've been resurrected. Something has happened to us. It's happened in us. It's the resurrection. You've been raised up. Resurrection. Romans 16. But if we've dead, have died with Christ, we shall also live with him. Colossians 2.13. And you being dead in your sins, the uncircumcision of your flesh, uh, for circumcision of your flesh, as you quicken together with him, having forgiven to you all your trespasses. And another translation of that's, and you dead as you always were in your transgressions and uncircumcision of your natural state. 
He has nevertheless given you life within himself with you, having forgiven us of all of, all of our transgressions. Now Galatians 2, 19 and 20 says this, uh, I, Righteous of the law, unto the, have a Christ died for me, I have died to the law, and all the law's demands upon me. And so he henceforth live to and for God. I have been raised up together with him. Seated together with him. I have been crucified with Christ. And yet I share in his resurrection. It is no longer who I live, but Christ lives in me. And the life that I now live, I live in the body. I live by faith in, in, in Jesus Christ, my reliance upon and reliance and complete trust on the Son of God, who gave himself for me, who loved me, gave himself for me. And the Second Corinthians 5.14 says this, through 17, For the love of Christ controls and urges within me and compels us, because we are, we are under the conviction that one died for all, then all died. And they died for all, that for all those who live might live no longer to and for themselves, but to and for him who died, who was raised again for our sake of justification. Therefore, if any person be in Christ, the Messiah, he is a new creature altogether, a new creation. The old previous moral and spiritual decayed thing has passed away. Behold, fresh and new has come. All right, now, the believer in Christ has uh, experienced a spiritual resurrection already he's legally seated and raised with Christ and spiritually he's drawing from the resurrection life of Christ right now his spirit is now experienced resurrection now the second question is this how is the resurrection signified to us we were buried therefore with him Paul said to the Romans by uh, the baptism into death so that just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father we too might habitually live and behave in the newness of life for if we become one with him by sharing his death like his we shall be one with him by sharing his resurrection as well by a new life for we live for God so this resurrection is signified by the fact that we are uh, received the baptism and we received well, in that baptism not only do we acknowledge the immersion into death we bring the immersion out of death into resurrection we emerge a twofold baptized into his death and we immersed and raised to walk in the newness of life his resurrection life so, so the whole redemptive act is this picture of a in our faith act of obedience to to the Lord in baptism remember we talked about that now what's the evidence of the spiritual resurrection number one an attitude of faith is established it's maintained in Rome, Romans 6 11 states this likewise reckon you all to be dead and deed unto sin and alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord now this attitude of faith is based on the revelation of God's Word. God's Word states that legally we are seen with uh, participating in Christ in death and participating in His resurrection, both death and resurrection. Through that baptism, we weren't there historically, it's obvious, either in His death or in His resurrection, either one. And over 2,000 years ago, but by work of the Holy Spirit and the Word of God, we're given that proposal, and we're given two things about this. We're given the information about what has happened to us legally in God, and we're given the Holy Spirit, uh, Word and Spirit together, we're given the Holy Spirit to make real, his rest, his, 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 to make it true, real in our lives, as the Holy Spirit operates in us, the resurrection power. Dr. Weymouth translated it like this, You all must regard yourself as dead in relation to sin, but as alive in relation to God because you're in Christ Jesus. Now, this is a faith position. Now remember, we're answering the question, 
What are the evidences of this resurrection? An attitude of faith. It's established and maintained. Now, this is an intellectual thing. You think about it. It's propositional. But the Holy Spirit comes and makes it real for you. You take up a position based on the historical, divine fact, the proposition that was given to you, that operates to you propositionally. That's what you do mentally. Now, you don't go by a bunch of feeling. It's not Christian science. Repetitive declaration of something over something so and something not so. We're not talking about that. We're talking here about the uh, the revelation of God that was given to us about our faith and to our faith. Now we respond by treating it as true. That's how you respond to it. Remember that under that proposition is a corresponding act of God to make that proposition real for you. So as by faith we take the position that the proposition requires then the Holy Spirit makes it real. Now, let's stop for a moment and talk about that. You read these in the Word, or someone teaches you the Word and preaches you the Word, by Jesus stripes you're healed. But you're not healed. You're sick. You may have uh, the cold, COVID-19, uh, cancer. But by Jesus stripes you're healed. Now, do you agree with him? All of your symptoms, all of the things that you live by, your five senses, will tell you that that's not true. You are sick. You may be dying. You are dying. But all your five senses tells you that that's not true. That by Jesus' stripes, you were healed. It's not true in your life. Are you going to believe what he wrote? He himself bore our sins on the cross, and by his stripes we are healed. Now, he gave you and brought to you divine healing. And he gave you divine healing to keep you alive so you can do your work here on the earth till it's time for you to leave. Because everyone dies. Your body is going to die. It does get old. It will die. But you don't have to die of diseases. I believe you don't have to die of demonic mess where he puts things on you to kill you. You can believe the propositions that are given to you in the Word of God. Well, we're talking about the basic fundamentals, but it goes on into every area of your life in this. By his stripes you are healed. My God supplies all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. Now, all things being equal, that you're not sinning every ten minutes, or you live in sin, or you habitually are this or that, which the Word tells you not to be, you would say, well, God may be that way. Well, his Word tells you to repent and turn around and go another way. That's the whole point of repentance. If you believe that, you may not feel any of it, but if you believe that and you start doing that, as what his proposition says, the Holy Spirit comes according to your faith because you did that. Faith is the, the evidence of faith is the substance of things not seen, the evidence of things not seen. Faith is, is believing that you have the title deeds of those things because he said that. The proposition, it's a mental proposition given to you. Your faith is mingled with it. The Holy Spirit comes and makes that proposition real to you. He heals your body. I remember the first time I believed God for healing, divine healing, my body from, I needed my sinuses healed, and I had hemorrhage, and my blood, my nose hemorrhage, and my knees were shot. And I asked him, you said you're healing, you have healing in your word. I, I read it over and over again. Divine health and divine healing. Uh, I believe you, God, for it. I believe you, Father, and Jesus, I just believe you. And the Holy Spirit spoke to me. I was young in the Lord, and he said, say this out loud with your mouth. You're washed and cleansed and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. You're healed by his stripes. You're washed and cleansed and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. And I did that. I asked him how long. I didn't get an answer. It was like someone hung up the phone. So I started saying it, saying what the word said about me, whether I felt it or not. And it was about the blood, more than anything, about the blood, about the blood, about the blood. Now, the blood has power in every song we sing, but I don't feel it and I don't see it but the Holy Spirit makes it very real in my life. It was 17 days I said that. Off and on, when I was alone, I said it all the time. I'm washed and cleansed and redeemed by the blood of Jesus. I just put my faith to it. I don't care how long it took. I know that the Word said that. I know that the Holy Spirit spoke to me about those things. And I said it for 17 days. At 4.30 in the afternoon, underneath my apricot tree in my backyard, it felt like warm honey was poured on my head and came out all through my body and came on my toes. And everything in my body was healed. 
I don't understand it. I didn't understand it there, except I believe the proposition that was given to me in the Word. I believe what was written. And I said it. And I did it. Stop sinning. I stopped smoking marijuana. Stop stop snorting cocaine. Stop living. <laughs> you know, live like a bandit and be a Christian. Oh, by his blood washes me and cleanses me. I'm redeemed. He made me this way. No, 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 no. He didn't make you an adulterer. Huh? He he didn't make you a robber, a stealer. I like to do these things, whatever perversion might be. He didn't make you like that. The world's fallen, and God knows how far it's fallen. But he came to give you Jesus and gave you that proposition. Here we go. This foundation is laid, the resurrection from the dead. Now, not only are we talking about Jesus being raised from the dead bodily and that we're going to follow in his footsteps, we also will be raised bodily. Same body we died in. I don't know how he's going to put it back together, but I do know that I have had that healing power go through me. I've had that resurrection power explode inside of me because I believed his word and would not listen to people would not listen to anybody trying to stop me because the word said this and I put that as final authority in my life. I, I must have been told a hundred times those tongues you talk in are not from God because that all passed away with the apostles. I heard that so often I said it's too late. I've been praying in tongues for over a year. It's too late. I've even had you in prayer time 20 years in the Lord and praying in tongues because I don't know how to pray about a situation that's higher and greater than what I can think. But I do know the Word says if I pray in the Spirit, the Holy Spirit prays for me and through me with utterances with tongues that I, I don't understand. The situation, you know, is the perfect will of God for me. So I would stay there and pray in tongues. I had demon spirits come up. I know they are. I can, I can sense them around me. I can hear them. But I don't heed them, but I hear them. And they told me those tongues are from the devil. And I said to him, and I did say that one time to him. If they're from the devil, then the whole the whole penitentiary system would have people talking in tongues. Because I know they're from the devil. I know they are. So now we're talking about us being raised up together in that resurrection power of the Lord Jesus Christ. That we're raised up with him. That, that's resurrection. We're raised with him in that power. Believing the proposition that he gave to us in the word. Now that brings us to this point a new life is manifest inside you a new life we should also walk in this newness of life J.B. Phillips said this we rise to in this resurrection power and this life on a new plane and you know that's true but how far can you go with that whatever that try to stop you the Amplified says that we too habitually behave in newness of life habitually I cannot emphasize too strongly to you that this has to come out of a proposition, a propositional affirmation that you make in agreement with the Word of God. Like I told you, I agree with His Word. Faith is agreeing with the Word of God over and against and above my senses, myself, against sin, against Satan, against circumstances, against the brethren who love me, which taking that position with the Word and God. I stand on the word. Take that proposition. Now, as you function in faith, the Holy Spirit honors it. And I told you before, you don't know sometimes how long it's going to take. You don't know, but you don't stop. Your faith is tested. Things are tested. Pain comes when you believe for healing. Bills pile up when you believe for money. Given it shall be given back to you, pressed down, shaken together, running over with, with good measure, men will give into your bosom. You have to do your part of the proposition. Tithe. Bring all the tithe in the storehouse to prove me herein. Will a man rob God? You read that and you say, well, that's passed away. No, it has not. No, it has not. In the New Testament, this is what I've really seen. It's not just tithe. It's everything. You're a, a slave, a love slave for Jesus Christ. He lets you have money. He gives you money. But if he demands what he wants, if he's got things going, if people need money because they're in rough shape, in Jerusalem when they first got saved, they had to divvy up, all of them come together in one pot because there was a lot of people who lost their jobs. You're part of that Christian sect, you're fired. They belonged. To, there were unions back then too. You lost your home. You come home and find your furniture out in the street. Because you didn't own the place you lived in. Somebody else owned it. 
that were very anti-Christ. And the devil's working real hard to stop that anyway. So you have a new outlook, a new way of living. You have to believe that the faith physician takes that proposition and stands. Now, the third thing is you have a new master now. The third thing, 2 Corinthians 5.15. They which live should not henceforth live unto themselves, but unto him who died for them and rose from them. The king. I told you, the king. Now, that's an interesting observation here if you look at it. The old master wasn't necessarily Satan or the devil. Nope. What Paul is saying is that uh, the old master was, was you, me. That was me. That brings us to the major, uh, the nature of walking in the flesh, the nature of walking in the spirit, but walking in the flesh. All unbelievers are totally in the flesh. All of them. A Christian is taken out of the flesh legally to the degree that he responds to to that, and what the Spirit is permitted to free himself from the things of the world. He doesn't live in the flesh, but he lives in the Spirit. Well, what is the flesh? Let's get a definition of it. The flesh is the tendency in our nature to self-gratifying behavior. That's flesh. Now, in a sinner, an unregenerated man, that's the total control. Sin reigns. But I don't care how good they seem, the sin reigns. Sin is self-operating. Independence from God. Therefore, sin is a man doing what he wants against what God wants. What he wants. You know, when this resurrection takes place, spiritually, he breaks that that uh, dictates of, of the flesh. He dictates the dictates of sin. He breaks with it. Now, sin is something apart from himself, but sin is that tendency to, in his nature, act independently from God. He breaks that. He breaks with it. That resurrection power is there. He no longer functions in terms of, of himself doing what he wants to do, but over and against what God wants done. So, a new master is obeyed now. And sometimes you have to work at it. You're no longer a master for yourself. You no longer live in response to the independence that uh, they're all autonomous beings, automatons, the robots, the beings in the flesh. I don't do what I want anymore. I now do what the master wants and what he wants me to do. It's written, most of it. Now the fourth thing, there's a new life purpose that's embraced too. Your purpose. If then you've been raised from Christ to a new life, thus sharing his resurrection from the dead, aim at and seek the rich eternal treasures that are above, where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God the Father. Set your mind on these things. And here we are again. Set your minds and keep it set on what is above. More and more and more we come to see that oppositionally it has to do with uh, the mind. The mind, over and over again. What I choose to believe, what I have a problem with is people, and I have for years, even working as a pastor, and I've been ordained for over 30 years now, but as a pastor and leading them into the truths of God and the wholeness that I had, whatever I grabbed, was their emotions and their feelings of every sort of their five-fold senses were constantly bombarding them, trying to overcome the promises that God gave, the statements that the Lord gave, that you had to believe them by faith, and they were just overwhelmed at times. But the proposition was there. If you're going to run with it, you got to run with it. So uh, foundations had to be laid, and that's what we're working on now. What, what have you been given? Who are you? What are you? Paul's telling you. What I embrace was the principle of life now is him. Set your mind and keep your mind set on what's above. The higher things. I constantly tell people that. Don't think on the lower things of the earth. Self-gratification that you have. What did Jesus want you to do? It's written in the Word. It's written right in the Word. Most of it's written in the Word. You don't have to pray for days to get the Spirit of God to tell you. It's in my Word. Read my Word. 
I find that if you read the Word and continue to constantly meditate and read and listen to the your heart and listen to the Lord and read and read, that keeps your mind above, not below, above the fray, above what the world tells you, above what your flesh is telling you, above the Word, above. You have a new master. His name is Jesus, not you, not the flesh. Uh, now, let your thoughts dwell on things above, not grovel on the earth, not things of the earth. And then you wonder, well, I don't know if I could do this. You need to be practical about this, very realistic. We all realize that we wrestle with an internal dichotomy. A constant tension seems to be there if you're doing it, anyone, if you're born again. For anyone to come against that is not... Not, it's not saved, very unreal. That tension is there. No matter how mature you become, you always be conscious of that inner war and confrontation that's there between two things. The flesh, lust against the spirit, and the spirit, uh, lust against the flesh. And they're going to be opposed. They're never, ever not going to be together. Now, after that stated, it doesn't mean that the outcome is going to be in doubt. It just stated as a fact. That that's, that's what happens. The real fact is, if you're a born-again believer, the flesh is uh, is listening against the spirit. It's, it's had its power broken. Therefore, it's not an even struggle anymore. You don't wake up every morning and face a titanic struggle with the flesh. It leads you leaves you in question who's going to be the victor today. It's not an even struggle. Now, the devil would have you believe that, that it is, but it's not. Read the Word. It's not an even struggle. You have the upper hand. You just have to maintain the upper hand. Walk in, in the Spirit. You maintain it first by keeping your mind set on things above, on the propositions that's been given to you. Truth is setting you free. Truth. Now, let me just digress in this. Well, yeah, uh, yeah. Well, him. Well, no, no. Let's go to the next one, the ultimate resurrection of all that's in the grave. Now, this has to do with the future. When is the future resurrection gonna can take place? Well, our Lord Jesus speaks about it in John chapter six, and this is the Father's will which has sent me, he said, that of all which he has given to me, I'm not going to lose any of them, not one, but I should raise them up again on the last day. The trump will sound. This is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who seeth the Son and believeth on him may have everlasting life, and I'll raise him up on the last day. At the last day, no man can come to me except the Father which has set me draws him, and I'll raise him up on the last day. I'll raise him up. Whoso eateth my flesh and drinketh my blood has eternal life, and I'll raise him up on the last day, at the last day. Now, very obviously, the Lord Jesus is, emphasizes over and over again the resurrection is a time fixed event, it's going to happen at a certain time. And it's going to happen in the last day. Now John 11, 23, 24, Jesus said unto her, My brother, your, your brother will rise again. I know that he'll rise again, the Lord, in the resurrection at the last day. Now, it's obviously, he had, uh, it was a common belief of those that who were sound in doctrine in the relationship with Jesus and God that there was a resurrection. The proposition of truth that they were given, Jesus had talked to them about it, Martha and Mary and Lazarus, there was going to be a resurrection of the body. They said so. Yes, on the last day, Lord. Now, Paul, in pleading his cause, said this, for the hope of the resurrection, am I called? Question here. Boy, he got them Pharisees and Sadducees fighting with each other. In the Corinthian epistle, he said this, if Christ be not risen from the dead, we're in our sins yet. 
we're of all men most miserable of what we're doing. Therefore, the resurrection is, is, the, is the keystone, the cornerstone of the Christian faith. The cross is where we, where God through Christ, through Christ dealt with our sins. It's mainly negative. The cross is mainly negative. It made an end to sin. It made an end to the old order. It made an end to God, God's claims on sinful humanity. Passed from judgment. The Christ, the cross made an end to things. Christ died. It's, it's the negative side of redemption. But He rose from the dead. When He rose again, He rose to introduce the whole prospect aspect, positive aspect for all of us. If there's no resurrection, then there's no proof. It's gone. That Christ successfully bore our sins. The proof, now this is written. The proof that Christ bore our sins that he was raised from the dead for our justification. And he showed proof of it. The resurrection is the proof that Jesus Christ successfully bore our sins and the judgment of God. It's done. And God raised him from the dead. Boom, up he came. So we're free. If he hadn't successfully borne our sins, our sins would have kept him there. He would have stayed in hell. But he successfully bore our sins. Death couldn't hold him anymore. It's done. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Behold, I show you a mystery, he said. We shall not all sleep but we shall be changed in a moment, in a twinkling of an eye, at the last trump, the last day. Uh, I don't know about, uh, uh, I don't think you have last or, last or trumps. The last trump is it. It's the last trump. That's the last trump, the resurrection. The last trump, that's it. There are no more. This is obvious at the end. The last day, the last trump that day, that time, the wind down. Wind it up. And the trumpet shall sound, the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall change at that point. First Thessalonians 4.16 also tells us, For the Lord himself should descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of the archangel, and with the trump of God, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. The same trump, last one over and over again. So there's a good witness right there. The future resurrection is going to take place at the last day, the last trump. That's it. So you'll know. Anything else other than that is wrong. Now secondly, how many shall be raised in the resurrection? How many? Now marvel not at this, for the hours come, says the Lord, to the which that all that are in the grave, all that are in the grave, we shall hear his voice and come forth. They that have done good under the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil on the resurrection of, of damnation. They're all coming forth. Everybody's coming up. The coming forth of some will be life, and some for the others shall be judgment. Now you see that all of them, Acts 24, 15, we'll quote this again. It's Paul making his stand, and he states this have hope towards God, which they themselves allowed, talking about the Pharisees, that shall be a resurrection from the dead, both of the just and the uh, unjust, the sinners. Both. Now, who does the raising? Who raises them up? Oh, I've said, I grew up in Utah. There's a lot of things. John 28, 25. Marvel not at this. The hour's coming in which the, all that are in the grave shall hear his voice, and shall come forth they that done good unto the resurrection of life, and that have done evil to the resurrection of damnation, judgment. Judd the Father raises men. First Corinthians 6.14 And God has both raised up the Lord, and will also raise up us by his own power. And again in Second Corinthians 1.9 it states this, But we have the sense of death in ourselves, that we should not trust in ourselves, but in God, which raises the dead. And then Second Corinthians 4.14, Knowing that he which raised up the Lord Jesus shall raise us up, raise us up by Jesus, and also present us with you. So God 
He's, in, he's instrumental in raising the dead. Yeah. Where God's not qualified in the New Testament, usually for us is the Father, Lord. Lord. We see this, we see the Son operating this too, also. In John 6.39, we read that, well, 6.39, the Lord Jesus said, I will raise him up on the last day. I will raise him up. I will raise him up. Jesus said this. Therefore the Son and the Father are both active in the resurrection. Indeed, the Holy Spirit's also involved. Romans 8, 11 says this, The same Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead dwell in you shall raise and quicken your mortal body. So the Holy Spirit also is involved in this resurrection. The whole triune God is involved in the resurrection of the dead. Us, all of us. Yep. So the Lord Jesus has risen historically as the first fruits. We are risen spiritually um, as a result of his redemptive work. And we awake the resurrection of our physical bodies. And we wait for that at the last trump. Uh, I told you, we're all going to die. You get old, but you don't have to die from certain things and live in certain ways. Did the apostles preach the resurrection? It's been a concern of mine that most evangelistic preachers and, and uh, outreaches that way stop at the cross. You can tell you when they're born again, but they don't talk about the progress of the resurrection, sanctification, salvation. But they bring an emotional pill based on uh, the Lord's physical suffering at the cross and how horrible it was and so forth. It was. There's no problem with that. But don't stop there. I, I know somebody right now that's he's been preaching for years, but he preaches nothing but the resurrection now, or the cross now. He stays at the cross. He camps at the cross. He don't go on. There's so much more that we need to have. Now, I think that accounts for a lot of our ills, that we're stuck. A lot of people are stuck right there at the cross. At the cross. Nowhere in the New Testament is the gospel preached without conclusion of the resurrection in their preaching. Nowhere. When Paul is telling the Corinthians about his gospel and what his gospel is, here it is. Now, here's the proposition. How that Christ died for your sins, according to the scriptures, but buried. And on the third day, he rose up from the dead. He was resurrected on the third day. Now, to stop at the cross would be, uh, it's not to tell the whole thing. And if you go through the Acts of the Apostles, you have the reported record of all the preaching that was done by the Apostles. They didn't stop short of the resurrection, period. They didn't stop short of the resurrection. The Apostle Paul, in laying out uh, his doctrinally for us, all of us, the whole battle of redemption, he didn't stop short of the resurrection. No, Christ died for our sins. Now, we stopped there. A lot of people did. They stopped there, and it's negative. Well, it's always negative. He died for his sins, but he rose for our justification. Now we go on. It only, not only took away our sins and my sins, which is wonderful, but he provided with me. It's real much, it's very important. It's like, I'm going to tell you like this. It's like a man who goes bankrupt. And I have a beneficiary. He's a wonderful person. He decides he's going to pay off my Bankruptcy, my loans, everything that I'm in debt to. He's going to pay it off. So he does. Now I'm left without a car or a house or food, a shelter, anything, a job. And I say thank you for paying off my bankruptcy. Put me in horrible debt. But you, I don't have anything to live on. Can I have something to live on? Well, that's what Jesus did for us in the resurrection. He, he gives you what you need. That's part of the resurrection. It's part of the deal. How's he going to go on without that? So, if you you need to read it. He screws his courage up and he asks the man that paid off his stuff, can can I ask you for a little more grace? I, I need uh, I need some some money since you paid off all my debts. I need a stake to start out in the situation. Could you let me have a little money? Uh, have enough to get started 
Well, that's kind of an anemic illustration of what's happened in the life of redemption, but it points out to you that the cross takes care of your debt, your debt to God, take care of it. But the cross doesn't provide at all for you to have a stake to go on in life. Now that's resurrection power. Your debts are paid. They were your unrighteousness. And Jesus paid for that. He took care of that on the cross. He took care of all your unrighteousnesses. Now you're only going to build up some more if he doesn't provide you with with some real righteousness. You'll immediately start sinning again. To preach the cross only would be that. It's produce a negative kind of Christianity. And that's what I think at least propositionally. In actual experience, who don't go much beyond the cross, they enter into the life of the Spirit and experience Yeah, they enjoy that, but they're not up to the experience yet. You haven't read it. Now, it's good to have your experience match your proposition. Now, there are many who go on and enjoy that, but they don't read it. Now, Christ died for us, but he rose again on the third day. Now, in that resurrection, he brings legally our justification, legally and vitally, the dynamics of the Holy Spirit into our lives to provide the dynamics for a new covenant life. That's what's given to you. That's very important, that part of the resurrection. We notice that the apostles, the apostles preach the resurrection Acts 17, 18, 32. Now, here's Paul in front of a bunch of Athenians, Greek Greek people. And he's uh, he doesn't attempt to approach them by philosophical arguments, which they did. He doesn't attempt to engage them in, in some kind of dialogue, spiritual dialogue, and his philosophy is better than theirs. He didn't do that. He preached on them Jesus. He made a declaration to them about the judgment of Jesus. Jesus and the resurrection. That's what he preached to them. No philosophies. No ways of living. What you should be like. He preached Jesus and the resurrection. Now there's an interesting thing here when you realize that uh, leave on Paul for a second. Let's, let's go back to the other apostles real quick. That after the resurrection... These men were, they didn't suddenly get a Ph.D. These are Galileans, fishermen. They didn't change from ignorant, unlearned men to uh, philosophical leaders and theological doctrines and intellectual giants. They weren't. Their Galilean speech betrayed them. They were fishermen. They were rough, hard, and tough. The nature of the dress, the nature of the way... They located who they were. They were still ignorant, unlearned men. That's what they were called. But they had been with Jesus. And they witnessed the resurrection of Christ. Now, the Bible says that as they preached, as they preached, ignorant, unlearned men preaching. There's no way that they could engage in dialogue with, with a well-instructed Pharisee. They were a well-instructed Sadducee at the time. They were one who was steeped in Greek philosophy even. They could not discuss those things academically with anybody. So what did they do? They made a declaration, a proclamation. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, he suffered and died and rose again on the third day for your justification. Now they're certainly not going to receive, they're not going to be received on the basis of their philosophical arguments as it's just not going to it's not there here's what the Bible says they gave their message and they simply say and we are witnesses of these things and here's the key phrase and so also is the Holy Spirit huh the Holy Reached of the Holy Spirit and the resurrection of Christ from the dead provides the entire dynamics for the success of the gospel. That's it. Right there. You can present the gospel academically, lay it out nicely and all the way through, hermeneutically, perfect all the way, but the thing that convicts and condemns, 
or convicts people of their sins it's not the brilliance of your argument it's the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit say you better come on listen to him I've told many people you hear that small voice speaking to you you better get with it my words won't help you but I can tell you how to do it they preach the resurrection now here's Paul in front of the Athenians I'm, Paul is a brilliant he's brilliant in intellectuals of the New Testament wasn't he now he could have discussed all kinds of philosophies with them and theologian, theological arguments but he preached to them he declared the statement to them and they loved to sit around and talk they go shopping just so they could talk let's go down to the agora let's go to the market <laughs> they buy their vegetables and spend the next two hours arguing with somebody down there discussions and arguments up on Mars Hill where they drug Paul in front of everybody that's where the big shots discuss things they wanted to know if anybody have a new thought you got something new and Paul said I got a new thought here and he preached Jesus no he preached unto them Jesus no no new thoughts and the resurrection and the resurrection now that must have been sheer nonsense to them and some scholars think that the, uh, he preached the resurrection they thought the resurrection was a, a new God or something anyway they he preached unto them Jesus and the resurrection and the Bible said that when they heard of it the resurrection some of them some mocked some others said well we'll hear him again so and that's normal I mean I've witnessed for years to people some mocked and some didn't and usually this one one guy over in the corner said I listen to you I want to I want to do this I want this yeah yes Hmm. Uh, the last part of this how be it certain men claved unto him and believed ah, ah. and when they heard of the resurrection for the dead some mocked and some would simply hear him they want to hear him again how be it certain men claved unto him and became believers in Christ including Demetrius and uh, and a woman named Damaris and others with them. Now think about that because that happens regularly. That's regularly. Now that's not the result of intellectual convincing. This is the result of the Holy Spirit saying, "Come on, what this man says is true." Well, get with it. Open their heart. It's convenient grace. It's the action. That's why you're witness. That's why you tell the truth and bring in the resurrection the hope of the resurrection and others mocked and others made jeered and made fun on the day of Pentecost the, the, the Jews said these guys are drunk they're drinking they're drunk <laughs> oh no. repent and the Lord brought 3,000 in now you're gonna get that to the gospel almost all the time you have to do a lot of intercession work and it'll bring up the, the number a little higher some will mock and some will procrastinate and some will believe but you have to be prepared for that yeah. Now, I don't think you have a Father Nash and you're not a Finney, but you could be. You could be. Father Nash would go into an area, into a city, and he'd find some elders there, and they would fast and pray. Sometimes over two or three weeks, fast and pray. And just pray it. And they'd rent themselves a, a room and get in there and get with it just interceding and interceding and interceding for the whole city and Finney used to lead everybody in town to Christ there were you know 95 percent of the town was was born again he preached Jesus and the resurrection his his savior had died for everyone and went to hell and rose from the dead for their sanctification for their redemption for everything they needed to become new creatures in Christ and start a new life now again Paul he, he get opposition as you will and you have to be ready for it now we quoted Acts 23 6 when Paul perceived in one part of the Sadducees and another part was Pharisees and he cried out in the council right then man because he's trying to get out of there I'm a Pharisee son of a Pharisee and the hope of the resurrection and I'm being I'm being messed with because I believe that the resurrection. Paul, 
laid his whole ministry of belief on the resurrection. But he knew they'd fight because Sadducees don't believe in the resurrection and Pharisees do. And they fought each other. Paul got away. Now, that gives the resurrection a... Paul is just... He usually preached the resurrection. Now... There's so much more to say about the resurrection from the dead, how to live your life in it and through it. Stopping at the cross, that's the negative side of salvation. Yes, you need to be sorry for your sins. And yes, you need to repent. Every day, part of it. It's part of our teachings. I've, I've taught, go back in my teaching and, and listen to them. Well, they may seem kind of boring to you, because they're not. I'm not doing stem winders somewhere. I just get you wound up. I don't do that. I'm teaching sound structural foundation from the word and I'm not great at it and I don't speak I'm not a good orator I'm not but I speak the word the resurrection very important substantial you need to have it this is the part of life you need to have these are the promises that God gave you it's not oh Lord I beg good let me have this no it's not based on that it will the Holy Spirit will check you in your behavior and you're to act like Christ. I am holy, so you be holy. That's what he's saying. Your happiness will be no greater than your holiness. I've learned that over 40 years. You may think that you can get away with certain things in the flesh, and that'll give you self-gratification, and it'll be temporal in some ways, and, and people will love you, and things will happen, and so forth and so on. But it's sin, whatever it may be. But you're not going to, in the long term, you will not be happier than you are holy. Part of the resurrection part that's yours now until you get a new body and then after we get a new body and we're with the Lord in presence I don't know what's going to happen he hasn't said much about it some people have seen it I saw heaven once not much to say it was so beautiful I got nothing to talk about I can't say it. there's nothing on earth like it it was fantastic but it didn't it won't help you it didn't help my faith much I asked the Lord, I said, why'd you show me heaven? And I asked him that for uh, over five years. Quite often, every week or so, I'd pray it. Lord, why'd you show me heaven? Because when I saw it, he didn't tell me anything. I didn't hear anything. I saw saints and angels and streets and cities, and it was pretty. It was actually wonderful. I was ecstatic. I was just excited. And he told me after five years, I showed you heaven. He just started talking to me in my prayer time, in my heart. I showed you heaven because your end days of your life are going to be so rough and so hard at times I'm going to show you the end from the beginning and that was it and I've had some rough times <laughs> they're okay I'm going to go on because I know my reward it's in the word it's in the word the resurrection Father I ask you to bless people that have heard this today help them Lord to understand to see your resurrection power from the cross on into the resurrection. We thank you, Lord God, and we praise you in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. If you enjoyed this, tell a friend, leave a comment. This is Mike. We'll see you again. Jesus is Lord.